Well, thank you for joining me about a topic that uh, I think is near and dear to all of our hearts right now, and that really is the future of work in services, right? And where's all this head? Um, and when you look at this, uh, we're really moving from a working in office centric, uh, yeah, some of us were hybrid before all this, to an office to anywhere. And it's, first of all, been a busy time for all of us, right? Uh, we've had to take care of our teams, make sure we're still taking care of our customers, our families being safe, obviously. Uh, and so we'll get started on this by taking a brief uh, bit of a history lesson. I know most of us all know this already, uh, but back in the 1700s, uh, we all know it was agricultural and based on craftspeople, right? Close to home, right? Close to home. And then we moved into the Industrial Revolution, and this was all about assembly lines, people moving to the city. This is where the office culture really got started, right? Because it wasn't only the assembly lines, it was also built around people coming in for HR, finance, marketing, all of these things had to be together for where the work was done, right? And then, you know, kind of in the 60s, uh, you started hearing about, you know, what was gonna be next, and this was, everything was gonna be seamless in the future. We were all gonna work a couple hours a week, and then, you know, we were just gonna spend the rest of our times vacationing, uh, being with the family, it was all about leisure and how we made things easy for all of us, right? And uh, this is kind of where we're at. I wanted to show just a quick video. Uh, this was earlier this year, and this is actually a judge talking with a lawyer uh, in a court, a uh, remote court. I have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to uh, uh, take, take We're trying to, we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, in the it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but... Uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's, I'm here live, but it's not, I'm not a cat. I can, I can see that. So look, uh, clearly uh, we are not as seamless as we need to be, and that's what we're all dealing with right now. So really when you look at the future of, of work for services, breaking it down into two areas to talk to you about today. The first is the emerging technology and people. We've been on this path for a while, right? We've been on path this for a while. So we've gotta take a look at where we're headed and where that future is. And then bringing it closer to home to the near time uh, things that we're all dealing with, and this would be around our culture, uh, and our team, and then open it up for questions and discussions. So let's talk about where these future technologies are at. Uh, we have user interface, we have things like augmented reality, robotics, and then wrapping it all together is artificial intelligence and business intelligence. And so when you look at the user interface to start with, uh, this has been evolving for decades, right? And it continues to get more sophisticated across all products, right? Uh, voice and uh, gesture recognition, eye tracking, we just saw that in the video, right? Touch and feel, uh, many of us have driven in a car. When you get close to the white lines or the lines on the road, the steering wheel starts to jiggle, right? Starts to let you know or vibrate that you're getting close to the line. Well, similar to that, our remote engineers, when they're talking to a customer, we have all of the uh, data stored that we're doing AI and BI on, and it tells us when a customer is most likely gonna be dissatisfied and flashes up a note to the uh, remote engineer while they're working the problem to let them know this is not headed the right way. We're not waiting for the CSAT one to two weeks afterwards or our customer satisfaction score, we're actually popping that up on the screen and the engineer can see, okay, wait a minute, based on the voice and tone, this customer is not happy and I need to do something different, whether it be get an L2 on the line or something needs to change, right? 
So this would be user interface to give you an example. And I can't wait to see where this goes over the next nine to 10 years. I think this has a lot of opportunity for all of us. The other uh, side of the emerging technology, the second one, extended reality, right? And you've heard this referred to as augmented reality, virtual reality. These are the VR headsets that we're used to seeing, virtual event uh, applications, smart glasses, all of these things. And for all of our customer service folks, this will be a huge improvement in how we provide services. Already today, our field engineers can use their phone when they're going to a customer site, can take a snapshot of the system in front of them when they arrive at the customer, see that what they saw in the snapshot, it says it's an XPS 13. It'll bring up the schematics, it'll verify that that's what they're out to help repair or bring back up and start to walk them through what they're supposed to do to fix it, right? So it's, it's close to that. By the way, this would be things that we're already starting to use in very infant form when you go to a restaurant, you snap the QR code, it brings everything up. But this has really large implications for all of us, especially in the self-help and in the repair area. The third area is around robotics. And this is something we all know has been on the manufacturing side. And for some of us that have service parts, you know, pick, pack, ship, making sure our parts get to the customer on time has been around. But there's gonna be more and more robotics brought into how and the way we deliver services, and that's really gonna help us as well. And look, it's about making things, as we know, simple, predictable. JB talked about this, easy, right? And robotics remove a lot of back-end processes that our customers don't find valuable. Uh, and, and so speeding that up, making it seamless and easy for our people so that they can spend more time in front of the customer, helping the customer deliver the outcome that they want. Uh, you know, you've also seen this, I am always uh, find it somewhat funny, you can be at somebody's house and see the automatic robot come through and, and vacuum. Uh, I've seen now neighbors with these automatic uh, lawnmowers. Uh, as a side note, I always see those, and I, I don't know why, but I always flash back to my father, and somehow he thought I hit, was his uh, robotic lawnmower for years. Artificial intelligence is what's gonna wrap all of this around for us and make it work. It'll be the booster for those three technologies. Help make them not only seamless, but also deliver a better experience with the data that they have. Now, over the last three to four years, we've hired uh, in Dell Technology Services around 200 data scientists. Uh, and they've helped us automate and digitize around 2,000 processes end to end. And what that means is, is actually digitizing, putting in the happy path of the way things, everything's supposed to work from beginning to end on those 2,000 processes. What that then bounces up against is the real data that's coming from the CRM and the delivery side, and when that happy path isn't followed, it alerts the individual and the manager real time, right? So that you're able to see what didn't happen. Why wasn't the process seamless? Why weren't we able to deliver that the way we thought it was? And when you add that in with the three items that we just talked about, robotics and the user interfaces, as well as uh, the uh, augmented reality, then you're gonna be able to take through and see all of this and speed it up for the way we deliver to the customer. And it really gives us a lot of great opportunities for that future of work. But before we do that, uh, and we talk a little bit further about the technology, obviously our people are be very key important to this. So what I thought we'd do is take a look at the poll I have up here. And if you wouldn't mind joining me on this, the, according to the Institute of the Future, what percent of jobs in 2030 haven't even yet been invented? Is it 25% A, B, 45%, C, 65%, or D, 85%? So let me know what you think on that. I'm sitting here looking at the votes. It's kind of all over, and actually pretty well balanced, except for the, the 25%. And I think we're gonna land somewhere, almost a tie here, if you can see. All right, 
So we're going we're gonna to stop there. It, so it looks like the, the, the rounding 65%. Believe it or not, the answer, according again to the Institute for the Future, is 85% of those jobs haven't even been yet created. Think about the impact that this is going to have on our team members, especially in addition to those emerging technologies we already talked about that we continue to develop. I can't even imagine uh, in just short, uh, nine short years that 85% of the jobs that'll be there in 2030 aren't even yet invented. And so with that in mind, our team members, we're really gonna have to help uh, relate and work them through two key components to get that human-machine partnership, and then the future of learning, right? The future of learning. So just for a moment, we're gonna talk about human-machine partnerships. And this is going to spread decision-making and collaboration. And I actually think it fits very nicely with what JB was talking about this morning, which is it's about making things easy uh, not only for the individual delivering or working with customers, but also cross-functionally across all of our organizations. I know that compared to five years ago, I'm spending way more time with the product group, engineering, marketing, and sales. Uh, because this is this, you've got to deliver the overall end-to-end -end outcome to the customer. Well, that's what this is about. And the lines are really blurring between humans and technologies. Remember when I was talking to you about the remote engineer, uh, the steering wheel, and the CRM pops up and lets them know things aren't really working as they thought? Well, we've also loaded in, as all of you probably have, is knowledge management system and access to the internet, so that when they're talking with the customer, it's automatically pulling those, that information up, uh, what they need to do to solve the problem, right? And so they're no longer typing as much, they're interacting with the customer, okay? So that they're able to focus on the customer instead of taking that downtime to type. That is a very simple example of what I mean by human-machine partnership. And again, offers a lot of opportunity. And then we have the future of learning to make all this work for our team members, not only just the, the human-machine partnership, and there's two areas that I'd like to cover on that particular item. First is the education of our youth, and the second would be how we're gonna all train and upskill all of us, right, the existing workforce. Now, in the youth part, I'm probably less worried about. I am always amazed, even coming here, uh, flying to Vegas and going through the airport, or watching my nieces and nephews. At age two and three, they're already interfacing with mobile devices, uh, and tablets. I'm sure you've seen this. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so they're, they're very used to that technology. I also know that in you know, my own children, uh, watching my son play video games, and I would say, hey, why don't you, uh, why don't you go out uh, with your buddies and your friends? And he'd say, I'm with my buddies and my friends on, you know, right now playing live. And so they're very used to that. We also had a, a very large internship program with Dell Technologies and Dell Technology Services. And those, for the last two years, have been remote. And it worked seamless. I was very worried about it. Now, we had to have defined projects. We had to change things around. But it worked. Uh, and we're having high acceptance rates. So I think the youth part of this is, is probably going to do very, very well. Training and upskilling the existing workforce that's probably where we're gonna have to spend a little more time, right? You have people like myself who still, when I get into a car and it's trying to parallel park for me, I just, I can't let it happen. I can't let go, right? I don't know why, it's just, I'm not into letting that uh, machine do it on its own, right? And so you've kind of gotta let go a little bit and help train our team members on, that is probably gonna be more of the future, right? The need for manual and physical skills will decline. Right? If you're doing more things automated, think about the remote engineer that was talking to that customer. They're not typing as much, they're interacting more. And so the need for technical uh, skills doesn't mean they're not important, they're still very important, but the need for emotional skills, EQ versus IQ, is going to increase. Again, going back to what JB was talking about this morning, 
We have to go make things simple across way more than just services. That means interacting, taking data, and delivering the outcomes still that our customers want. You have to have individuals that are going to be able to work across those aisles and still deliver the outcome to the service. And that takes partnering, that takes EQ, that takes give and take, right, across a wide uh, swath of what we're doing today. So, and in addition to that, the half-life of skills uh, has dropped from 30 to around five years. And my guess is it's even shorter than that now. So not only are we gonna have to retrain, we're gonna have to have the pro uh, process that get tra trains us all in very short order. Go back to that 85% in 2030, right? Uh, constant learning and do we have not only team members but the systems and the processes that will allow us to do that. It also has implications on who we're hiring. Right, you can take that further. Now, the traditional way of opening up a requisition, at least uh, for most of us, was you would write down everything that needed to be done and then the qualifications. And in the qualifications, you would put maybe a uh, four-year degree IT uh, programming, coding, let's say, for example. Uh, maybe you need an MBA, something pretty specific. And that was a way for us to define what we needed. But maybe that's not the best measure, right? Maybe it's the skills you need, uh, and maybe you have somebody with a four-year degree in English, but knows Python and can really code, and you have ways to test them remotely through this AI and BI to see that they have all that capability. That opens up a whole wide door for new talent. And not being connected to an office, right, and being connected to this hybrid work environment, uh, work from anywhere, Think about the potential of where talent is at now and where you can go. No more relocations, you're gonna be able to hire talent globally wherever the best talent is at, and that is a competitive advantage, right? And decision making, you know, we've all been uh, working on that, but look, it's gonna be, you're gonna have to have less experts out in the field, most likely with this technology and specialists, right? Now that doesn't mean they need, don't need to know what they're doing, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is this, right now, uh, for Dell Technology Services, we have a support assist program. It does proactive, predictive service and lets you know what the problem is beforehand. So if you went back five years ago, our field engineers, when they went out on site, had to know hundreds of systems. They just had to memorize and know all that when they went out there. And they were doing the diagnosis and fixing the problem. Now when they're going out, they still have to know what they're doing, but they have the assistance of knowing what the problem is, where they need to fix the problem, and what the issue was before they get there, right? It's assistance. It's about not having to be an expert in everything, knowing what you're doing, and it's gonna make it easier for us to, to deliver service. But we're gonna have to prepare folks for that. And as we move to the hybrid and pivot to hybrid work more near term here, I thought we'd do another poll so hybrid, uh, you know, where did you first see hybrid being done? Was it in like on a TV show? I Love Lucy, The Brady Bunch, or Succession? We're seeing what we got here. Very few on I Love Lucy. And it looks like everybody chose what I did, which was The Brady Bunch, right? Uh, and so if we go to the... Back to the presentation real quick. So, look, I don't know that there's a right answer here, okay, to be honest with you. But that's where I first saw hybrid being done when I was a kid. And that was Mike Brady coming home and, and working uh, architecture, I think it was, down in his office uh, at nights and on the weekends. Also appeared to be where everybody went to tell him his problems. I think I would have been headed back to the office. Uh, but, but look, that hybrid's been with us for a long, long time. And many of us remember when mobile phones came out and they allowed us to take calls while we were driving home, right? Or on the weekends. Uh, I actually remember the first portable compact I got way back when uh, in accounting and finance and, and it wasn't very portable, but we could work from home at nights and weekends. But it was seen more as an add-on you still need to go to the office. It just allowed you to work longer hours uh, and be in contact. But that was kind of some of the beginning we've all lived in with hybrid, right? 
and so the key takeaway is, is that's been with us for a long while. But it's clearly here to stay and is going to be a competitive advantage for all of us that can figure out how to make all this work and still deliver that great service. You know, McKinsey did a recent study and they showed that 75% of people today want to work at least two days from home. And I think that that's probably just the beginning. I think when you get down the road that that only increases that flexibility uh, that people want. And I also, as we talked about, think it's going to be a competitive advantage for companies that can go figure out how to make all that work because your access to great talent is unlimited. It's global, it's anywhere. And so we really should start, probably stop calling this uh, hybrid work and start referring it to office to anywhere work, right? I mean, it is going to be anywhere. But it's going to take an adaptive mindset, okay? And that is going to be important for all of us. You know, the Industrial Revolution took about six decades, give or take. The Digital Revolution, six to ten. And these are just roundabout numbers. The hybrid that we're all in, even though it's been with us, took about six months for everybody globally to adapt to very quickly. For myself and the team, it was about two weeks, okay? We, about 50% of the team members were flexible hybrid before the pre-pandemic. And then when that happened, we had to get the other 50% very, very quickly uh, to remote. And I was amazed, it worked, it worked. And it was not seamless, but it was, we were able to take care of the customer, get everybody remote with their broadband, get the systems that they needed out there, the cameras, all of these things. And I had to say to myself, uh, that adaptive mindset, maybe I was wrong on which jobs needed to be close to the office. Maybe I was hanging on to the reins just a little too tight. And maybe this will give us the better access, like I said, to talent around the globe. So an adaptive mindset, right? But we also have to worry about our culture, not just our team. And so, you know, for those that are new to the org, uh, uh, you know, the org and the hybrid uh, model that we're in, we're going to have to worry about this culture. And shifting it, you know, is no easy feat. We know that. Culture takes time. You know, Edgar Schein actually created a great model where he talked about the organization uh, culture in three aspects. Artifacts, these are things you can see, touch, feel values. Uh, these would be ethics, goals, norms that we have. And then assumptions. I just told you about a base assumption. I kind of thought, you know, 50% of the people pre-pandemic, those folks that were there, we probably needed to be close to the office. The assumptions you can't always see. They're beneath that iceberg. Values probably aren't going to change a whole lot for companies uh, because of this. But the artifacts, they absolutely do. The things we can see and touch, right? We had to get people set up on Zoom. Uh, we went from having face-to-face -face meetings to doing you know, re recordings or videos. Uh, and all of these things took time for us to kind of sort out and get done. And so we're working probably a lot of us with our teams on this. And for some uh, organizations, like I said, the hardest piece won't be that artifacts and values, again, probably don't change a whole lot for us. But those assumptions, those are what we're probably struggling with uh, at a management level, right? Who can be there? Who can? Is it just as productive? Can program managers really do programming and working together if they can't be in the office on the whiteboard? So it does seem like new territory when you get to that level, but it isn't. It really isn't. And if you think about it, there's a lot of teams out there, a lot of you out here uh, in the audience that come from big five uh, field organizations where remote's been around and hybrid forever. Sales teams, right? So that culture really is there. You're just going to have to tap into where the places it's already been working. Now, I remember. Uh, for a, a great amount of time, we always were trying to figure out how to bring the people that were remote or hybrid 
into the culture of the office because when you did studies, they said they didn't feel connected. Well, now that we're all there, we're going to have to figure out how to rewrite that rule book and how to bring everybody. So it's actually an opportunity to reinforce and strengthen where we're headed. But look, it does, uh, it does pose some near-term problems for all of us. We're going to have to rethink how we were delivering and doing face-to-face, -face, how we reach out and touch uh, our team members, either through video or through phones. And, you know, creativity, I worry about that, right? Um, how do we still make sure that we're able to bring up ideas? You know, I, for example, get a lot of energy when I'm in a team room uh, with people. You can shake hands before the meeting, meet new people, uh, talk to old people about things that you've done since you haven't seen them last. I mean, that's an energy. You get a connection from it, right? And you can get somewhat isolated with team members in Zoom and only see the person you're talking to. It's very efficient for meetings, but it may be just a little too efficient. So you have to remember to reach back in and pull people in, make sure you're getting those brainstorming uh, sessions going, because you do miss that casualness of, the, of it all. And look, uh, numerous surveys have said that, believe it or not, the executives uh, and managers are struggling more with this. I think everybody is to, an adapt, to adapt, by the way, but the executives is struggling more with this uh, from an autonomy and a management standpoint than the team members, right? Because everything that we've learned about how we manage and how we also interact with our team members has changed for us, right? And so we have to get that completed as well when we looked at it. So there's really three uh, things that we focused on from Dell Technology Services I thought I'd talk to you about on this near term. That's not to say it's perfect. This is a absolute journey that we're on, uh, along with all of you, on learning on how we do this. But I thought I'd talk about the three things that I have learned. One is uh, make sure you're still doing things from an inclusive and authentic leadership standpoint. Now, early on, we were trying to reach everybody, so we would pre-record messages, right? So we'd pre-record them, and they were scripted. I got tremendous feedback from the team that said, quit doing that. Uh, be authentic. Be on there. Have mistakes on it, just like you would if you were doing a face-to-face -face on stage. Nobody wanted to see pre-recorded or scripted meetings. So we make sure we quit doing that. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have talking points, but I always had talking points that I wanted to get across, but I make sure I cover all those. But nothing is scripted and nothing is pre-recorded anymore. Uh, I also went to answering all the questions that everybody saw, and we allow everybody to see them, online, live. So I'm scrolling through this. You know, again, it was myself interacting with the team. And, and by the way, I did make mistakes. They see our cat and our pets and family members. But look, that's what people are, everybody's living with, right? So it's, it's not clean, it's not crisp, but it's me, right? And so that's what they were looking for. Uh, make learning interactive. So uh, pivot to things, uh, whether your training can be mobile so people can use it wherever. Uh, on emerging technologies, we're still having seminars with people, bringing in uh, talent from all across the globe, not just Dell Technologies, but the people that can talk about where things are headed. It's an opportunity, right, to reach out and do things differently and have our team members see and hear from a lot of different uh, people around on the industry and where it's headed. We've enabled job shadowing. It's actually working better. It's, I still wish probably in some cases it was in person, but global job shadowing so that they can join the Zoom meetings. It has to be organized, but you can see what other people are doing to give them ideas about career and where they're headed. Uh, and then the third is we've really said, well, this is good on those base assumptions, and we can use on the third item hybrid to be a catalyst for change. We can use it to change things. Rethink how work gets done. This opens up a whole new way of doing business. Uh, do we really need to be doing it the way we were? Are there opportunities, as JB was talking about, to make things simple, to actually get rid of steps that our customers don't value? So one way we started doing that is a large suggestion box that we call Let's Fix It. And every weekend, I get to look at the new items and it's people submitting things that didn't work for our customers. 
and how do we fix that? And we have a closed loop corrective action that goes back and fixes all those and communicates with the individual so it's not just that they're putting it in there and hearing nothing back. And so people enjoy being part of that group. So some final thoughts on this. Uh, look, the emerging technologies is reshaping the entire landscape. We all know that that was happening way before the pandemic, pre-pandemic. But it's all sped up as well as we grab a hold of this and are leveraging it, in some cases because we have to, and in a lot of cases because it provides a better experience for our customers. Our culture, uh, our team members, you know, they need the long-term focus. It's not just on the uh, surface, on those artifacts. They're trying to read where all of our assumptions are at. You know, what is our assumption on remote work? What is our assumption on the delivery, how we're doing service? And so we have to be authentic. We have to be honest, clear, and we have to tell them it's a journey, right? This isn't like I can only tell you in the next six months. This will, what will work for the next six to months and a year. We're going to learn from it, and we'll keep developing it. But hybrid is here to stay, and this work from anywhere. So we all know that that's real, and really that the future of services uh, has you know, no endpoint. That's what's great about this. We're going to be able to continue to develop it, to continue to integrate it for our customers' outcomes way beyond just the service model. And in many ways, we are closer to that Jetsons future that you saw the slide earlier, where we're going to be able to bring this together seamlessly for the customers and their outcomes. And I look forward, as always, to working with all of you and learning with you uh, along the way and the journey and figure out how to bring that to reality.